What's up guys, I'm Jads, and in this video I'll be giving a crash course in RimWorld for total beginners. A lot of people have told me they're interested in RimWorld but are intimidated by what they perceive as a steep learning curve at first, especially if they're new to Colony Sims. So if you've ever said that to me in a Twitch chat, this video is for you. Now, this tutorial is not going to get into game strategy, it's just designed to give you the absolute basics so that you have the confidence to explore the game on your own and see what playstyle works for you. All that being said, let's get started. Click New Colony, and then you're on your scenario screen. Here's where you pick how you want to start the game, how many colonists, also known as pawns, and what supplies you're going to crash with. I very highly recommend starting with Crash Landed until you get the hang of the game. Then you pick your storyteller. This is basically the omnipotent being that sends events to you in-game. There are three in the base game, Phoebe, Cassandra, and Randy. The main difference between them is how much time they give you between the challenges they send. Cassandra Classic is my favorite because I think she does a great job scaling the challenges up as your colony becomes more advanced. You then pick your difficulty. You will not get any raids on Peaceful. I recommend Community Builder or Adventure Story for your first playthrough. Also, you pick your save mode. You cannot reload any prior saves on commitment mode, so I strongly recommend reload any time mode unless you're looking for a high risk challenge right off the bat. So then you'll generate your world. This is the world seed up here, and you can type whatever you feel like in there. And you can also adjust any of these planet settings, as well as how many different factions of each type you want to populate your planet with. Leave all of this untouched for a classic RimWorld experience. So now I have my generated planet. You can see that we are not alone here. There are a ton of different factions. You can click on them to see what your starting relationship is with that faction. Hostile factions will raid you. You'll also notice the different terrain colors. These are different biomes. If you zoom in, you can see the little hexagonal map tiles. Click them and then click the terrain tab to open up information about that map tile and the biome it's in. All of this information is relevant, but the key things to look at on this tab are the temperature range and the growing period, which is how many days out of the year you can expect to grow food. In this tutorial, we're gonna land in a temperate biome because I find those the easiest. So now that we've chosen our map tile, we pick the three colonists we're crashing with. Up at the top are the three we have selected, and down here are the others you can choose from. You drag them up here to select them. You can also just hit randomize to get a new colonist to replace the one you have selected. Your colonist skills are here. They go up to 20 maximum. If they have a flame bias skill, it means they're interested in it and will learn it faster and enjoy doing it. A double flame means they are passionate about it, so it's an even bigger buff. Some colonists will have a dash instead of a number, or they will have certain work types listed in this section over here titled incapable of. That means that they cannot do those work types. You might see violent, dumb labor, or caring in this spot. Incapable of violence means your colonists cannot fight, not even to defend themselves. Incapable of dumb labor means they will not haul items or clean. Incapable of caring means they cannot tend wounds. I highly recommend not bringing along anyone who's incapable of anything in your first landing party, just because it helps to have all hands on deck. Then down here are their traits. Some traits have an effect on their relationship with other colonists, their work speed, and their mental break threshold, which is at what mood level they snap. You can hover over the traits to read about each one. You can see your colonist's starting health over here. Colonists with injuries will be in a constant amount of pain that will affect their movement speed and mood, even if only a little. Some colonists will be withdrawing from a chemical substance. This will be in bright pink, if so. Do not land with one of those pawns at first. They take a very long time to break the addiction and get increasingly difficult to manage as the withdrawal approaches 100. Along the very bottom of this panel, you can see a summary of the skills present in your colony. Make sure you're landing with at least a four or five in construction as you need that skill level for some important items. I would also try to have at least a four or five in cooking, medical, plants, and someone with an interest or passion in intellectual so that they can be a researcher. Once you have your landing party selected, let's go ahead and land. All right, so we've landed. Let's pause and I'm gonna go over the UI here. Along the top, you have your colonists. Their mood is shown as the level of lighter blue behind them. The higher, the better, obviously. Down here, you can see their basic info and you can set how they respond to threats. It defaults to flee, I'm gonna set it to attack. They usually can't outrun animals, so it's better to stand their ground and fight than try to run. You can also click info to see a bunch of stats on them, the speed at which they do different types of work, all sorts of records about how long they've been in the colony, etc. You can search the info tab for any particular piece of information using the search box. The log tab here shows you their interactions with other living things, both positive and negative. You can check this to see how they're interacting with other pawns or what hurt them in a battle. 
The gear tab shows you what clothing they have on, their inventory, and their comfortable temperature range. You can force them to drop anything by clicking the drop arrow. The social tab shows you their opinions of other pawns and in parentheses, that pawn's opinion of them. Hovering over it gives you an explanation of why their opinion is what it is. Negative interactions or negative traits will lower their opinion, but positive interactions and positive traits will raise it. You can revisit their skills and traits in the bio tab. Note that there is some gradual skill decay over time if your pawn does not use a skill. You can also change their name by clicking this rename button up here. You would click this button to banish them from your colony. The needs tab is likely where you will spend quite a bit of time early game. It shows you your colonist's physical needs as well as a breakdown of why their mood is what it is and how close they are to a mental break. During a mental break, your colonist might attack another pawn, kill your pet, destroy something valuable, or wander around in a daze for hours, so you want to avoid those. You can use the info here to try and mitigate poor moods before the situation becomes too dire. Then we have their health tab. It shows you their current physical status and what is affecting it. You can see move speed, manipulation, consciousness, a ton of information. We'll spend more time in this tab later when we talk about tending wounds. So that mostly covers the pawn information tabs. Over here on the right hand side of the screen, you'll have your colony status, such as the current weather, any alerts, and the game speed controls. You can also use the space bar to pause and the one, two, and three keys to control the game speed. We just landed, so it's not saying much in the way of alerts right now, but when you do get alerts, you can hover over any of them for more information. So now for all these tabs along the bottom, which is what you will use to control your colony. The architect tab is where you will give orders from, as well as lay the blueprints for your pawns to build everything in your colony. The orders tab is where you will find specific tasks, such as mining, hauling, harvesting, chopping trees, and so forth. We aren't going to go through all of these options, as many of them will become self-explanatory as the tutorial continues, but I want to spend a special moment on the Zone tab to explain zones and areas. Stockpile zones are areas where your pawns will store items. Food, clothing, weapons, anything that isn't nailed down. So I'm going to lay my stockpile zone, and then I'm going to click Storage. From here, you can control what items are allowed to be kept in this stockpile. It defaults to all items except corpses and chunks, meaning chunks of stone and unprocessed steel. The sliders along the top allow you to set what quality of item you want kept here. For example, maybe I want to keep weapons in this stockpile zone, but only weapons that are in decent shape, say over 50% hit points. I would uncheck everything except weapons or use this clear all button and then check weapons and then move the slider to show I'm only accepting items between 50% and 100% hit points. You can also set the priority of the stockpile. Maybe I want another stockpile for any overflow weapons, but I'd much rather have my pawns bring weapons to this one first. I can set the priority a bit higher and pawns will choose to carry to this stockpile first and only start filling up the other stockpiles when this one is full. A dumping stockpile is a stockpile that defaults to accept corpses and chunks. Usually I toss down a dumping stockpile a bit farther from my base, so colonists have somewhere to haul rocks and dead bodies if I ask them to. A growing zone is self-explanatory. You can create a growing zone, then use this option to choose what crop to plant. You can also decide whether or not your colonists are allowed to sow or cut plants in the zone. The home area is an area that by default is around structures that you've built. Your ponds will only put out fires that occur within the home area and will also only clean within the home area. And that brings us to allowed areas. This is a super useful tool. So let's say you want to confine a certain colonist to one area of your colony. For example, maybe we want to make one colonist stand over here. You can go to manage areas and create a new area. Let's give it a name. And then you'll go into the schedule tab to assign the colonists to that specific area. They will not leave it until you let them unless they have a mental break. Then we have the work tab. The work tab is where you assign different jobs to different colonists. The categories of work are along the top, organized from highest priority to lowest. By default, pawns will move from left to right across the list and complete the jobs they're assigned to. You can hover over their squares to see what their skill is in that job. This button up here allows you to choose exactly how you want each pawn to prioritize different tasks. Basically, the way it works is now, you can set each task to a different priority level ranging between 1 and 4 by clicking or right-clicking in the box. Pawns will still read the jobs from left to right, but they will also now read them in numeric order. So for example, your pawn will go through their list and do every task labeled priority 1 first, 
then restart at the beginning, do every task labeled priority two, then priority three, and so forth. I do find manual priorities super essential now, but I'll be straight with you guys. I didn't use it for my first 200 hours in the game at least. So don't let anyone shame you into using it if you don't want to yet. It's not, it's not absolutely necessary when you're still getting the hang of the game. Now the schedule tab allows you to set a specific schedule for your pawns, time for working, recreation, sleeping, etc., as well as set what area they're allowed in. Pawns will usually be pretty efficient even if you don't set a schedule for them, but if you notice them not getting enough sleep or recreation, it's helpful to set one. In the assign tab, you can assign different outfit types as well. There are some default outfits already set up, but you can also create your own if you want certain people to wear certain types of gear. You can do the same with diet. By default, the lavish food restriction means pawns can eat anything from the worst quality to the most lavish food. I usually open this up and turn off corpses and raw meat, though sometimes in desperation you may need to allow that food type again. That is totally up to you. You can also set what's called a drug policy for each pawn. The default is social drugs, which is basically just your pawns with addictions to any substances can use those substances, but should only use beer and smoke leaf joints to relax. You can even set a schedule to allow how frequently a pawn should partake in a certain drug or under what mood conditions. Here, you can also tell your colonists how much medicine you want them to carry on their person at all times. This could be useful during a raid if they suddenly need to tend to a fallen comrade, which is a new thing that we'll be able to do in the 1.3 update. So now we have the animals tab. This shows what tame animals are part of your colony. We currently only have the pet we landed with, a horse. Uh, you can tell your pawns to slaughter your animals here or release them to the wild as well as assign them to an area. Now you can see we don't have an area option for our horse, it just tells us our horse isn't in a pen. This is because horses count as livestock in 1.3. So we'll come back to this tab later in the tutorial when we're going to be setting up the pen. The wildlife tab shows you a list of all the wild animals currently on your map. You can click them to see their location. You can also assign animals to be hunted or tamed by your colonists. These two columns show you the percentage likelihood that the animal will attack your colonists in the event that they try to hunt them or tame them and fail. You can click the info icon here to see details on each species. And you can also use the search bar to find information such as the animal's DPS, the amount of meat you would expect to get from it, and so forth. Now we have the research tab, which is in some ways the core of the game. Green items are the research your colony already has unlocked. The grayed out items indicate that you haven't completed prerequisite research needed for it. Clicking on an item will tell you what this research unlocks for your colony. For example, if I research tree sowing, I will unlock all these types of trees to plant in a grow zone. I will then be able to research cocoa if I so choose and be able to make chocolate. Once you have a research bench, you can start researching these items. The end goal is technically to make it to the end of the research tree, research all of these spaceship parts, assemble a ship, and launch off the planet again. Though whether or not you end up doing that with your colony is completely up to you. I've only launched two times in 1200 hours. The history button, which looks like a little open book, opens a bunch of information about your colony. This graph shows you your colony wealth over time. Um, anytime you get a new pawn or you know have nice things in your colony, the colony wealth is going to go up. The colony wealth is what controls how your storyteller scales the threats that it sends you. The more wealth, the more intense the threats are going to be. The messages tab is a record of alerts you get in game and is quite useful to review any messages or alerts you close too quickly. I do this constantly. And then the statistics panel is just a little text summary of your colony. The Factions tab shows you your current standing with the different factions in your world. You can improve relations with factions by releasing prisoners after raids, trading with them, sending them gifts, and attending peace talks, which is a quest that will sometimes pop up. Now this last button here is where you will save your game, quit, and bring up game options. If at any point you want to change your difficulty or storyteller, you can use this to go to storyteller settings. You can also change the autosave interval and what units your temperature is displayed in from the options menu. So in the bottom right here, we have all these little buttons. Most of them are overlays. This sprout icon is the fertility overlay. It shows you how fertile the land is for planting. In the very bottom left corner of your window, it will show you what sort of ground your mouse is hovering over, the walk speed of that type of ground, the fertility, and the amount of light that that individual spot on the map is currently getting. Obviously, you want to plant in the green or very bright green areas. The yellow areas will have reduced fertility, and you simply won't be able to grow at all in the areas with no color. 
This little overlay that looks like a house shows you what areas have a roof over them. Light green is a shallow roof or a constructed roof, which means that you'll be able to remove it if you go into that zone tab and click remove roofs. However, a darker color green means it's like heavy overhead mountain, like inside a cave, and you will not be able to remove that sort of roof. This overlay is important when you're mining or deconstructing buildings because you want to make sure that you remove the roof before removing the supports, otherwise it could collapse and crush your ponds. I cannot tell you how many of my ponds have been decapitated this way. The beauty overlay will show you the beauty value at any given spot on your map and what's affecting it. So for example, hovering right here, I can see that there are big beauty debuffs from these chunks. Uh, so this helps you keep your living quarters more aesthetically pleasing to your ponds, uh, which will keep them happier and thus more efficient. And then this button toggles the visibility of zones. So if you don't want that light pink or light green background to a zone, you can turn it off. And then this last one toggles the learning helper if you want that in-game tutorial. All right, so let's get into a little gameplay here and set ourselves up to survive the night. First up, you can see all the items I landed with are forbidden. They have those little red X's over them. To unforbid the items, I'm gonna open the Architect tab, go to Orders, and use the Allow tool. You can drag it over the forbidden items, or you can right-click on it and select Unforbid All Items. You could also just select the item that you want to unforbid and press F. Next, I'm gonna have my colonists equip weapons. Select a colonist, then right-click on the weapon you want them to use and choose Equip. I recommend consulting their bios first to see if they would be best with melee or ranged. After we have our weapons equipped, I'm going to take a look at the map and choose where I want to set up my initial camp. An area next to fertile ground and some natural cover would be ideal. I'm going to turn on my fertility overlay to help me out. It looks like this is a good spot up here. We have a little bit of natural cover, um, plus a little, a little patch that we can get started with some crops in. So I'd like my colonists to start hauling all their items over here so that we can get our inventory consolidated. I'm going to open up the Architect tab, click Zone, and create a new stockpile. I'm also going to go into the Storage options on this stockpile and set it to allow animal corpses. Then I'm going to uncheck Rotten at the top. This way, your colonists will haul their fresh kills here too, but they won't haul like animal skeletons from across the map here, because those are not useful to us. Now, it's important to set up shelter right away to protect your items. If you click on them, you'll see that they're deteriorating due to being outdoors. If their hit points gets to zero, they're going to waste away into nothing and you lose them. So we're going to go into the Architect tab and then to Structure, which is where we find all our actual like building parts like walls and doors. I'm going to tell my colonists to build some walls. Only materials that you have will appear as an option to you. Wood is highly flammable and pretty weak but it's also the quickest to build and we have a bunch already. So we're gonna build out of wood and you can always replace it with stone walls later. So we'll also add a door and then bam, my colonists will automatically roof it. There are a few other things you should build right away to improve morale as much as possible. First off, they need somewhere to sleep. If you have enough wood, go ahead and get down some beds. You can find them under architect in the furniture tab. If you don't have time or resources to build a bed, you can put just a sleeping spot inside, at least that way they will not sleep outside. I would also get down a form of recreation quickly, such as a horseshoe pin for them to play horseshoes at. You can find the very limited as of right now recreation options under recreation in the architect tab. It also helps to put down a table and chairs since they prefer to eat sitting at a table and if they have to eat standing up, they'll get a little debuff on their mood that lasts like way too long. Now, since I happen to land with a livestock animal, my horse, I need to build a pen or eventually he's just gonna wander off and return to the wild. I'm gonna go into structures and I'm just gonna use this fence to build a pen. You can actually also use walls to build a pen, but I'm gonna use fences because I think it's cuter. The only downside is that predators can climb over fences. So whatever livestock you put in a fence will not be safe from being hunted by like a cougar, for example. So once I have my pen completed, I'm gonna go into the miscellaneous tab and get a pen marker and put this inside the pen. Once that's built, you can click the pen marker and then you have these three tabs here that you can use to control the pen. I can assign what sort of livestock is allowed in the pen. I can review how much nutrition growth is actually in the pen um, and how much is being consumed by my animals that are assigned to it. And I can control what sort of plants I want to cut down inside the pen. You can see my colonist has brought my horse into the pen and I have plenty of nutrition in this space, so we're just gonna leave him here for now. 
All right, so we are now set up to at least survive our first couple nights and maybe not even be in that poor of a mood about it. So let's look at how to begin producing more food and supplies. There are a few ways to find food. You can farm, you can forage, and you can hunt. To start farming, we're gonna throw down a growing zone. Rice is the fastest growing crop, but corn produces the most yield per harvest. I always like to start with rice just so that I can get a little stockpile of food going. So I'm gonna to go to the architect tab, then zones, and then choose grow zone and change the crop to rice. As far as foraging, you can find berry bushes and other wild growing plants to harvest. Different biomes have different plants that provide food. Once you have some raw food, you should cook it to increase your pond's happiness and reduce the risk of food poisoning. You will need either a campfire or a stove. If we want to do a stove, we can find it in the production tab, but we're going to throw a campfire down because that's just faster. You can find the campfire under the temperature tab. Now that we have it, we need to create a production bill. You'll click add bill and get a drop down of all the possible products that this workstation, the campfire, can produce. Campfires have super limited options, so I recommend getting a stove as soon as possible, but we're just gonna choose simple meals. Then we're gonna open up the bill details. Here, you can set how many times you want your pawns to complete this bill. If you set it to do 10 times, your pawn will cook 10 meals and then never cook again. If you set it to do until you have 10, your pawn will cook until you have 10 meals stockpiled and then stop until your stock of meals drops down. Then they'll start cooking again. You can set at what amount you want your pawn to start working on it again. If you set it to do forever, your pawns will cook until you have no more ingredients to cook with. You can also set a certain colonist to do this task or a certain skill level required, and you can even pick what stockpile you want them to carry the completed products to. Over here is where you can set allowed ingredients. Now, my pawn assigned to cooking will get to this when they finish their higher priority tasks. If you want them to stop what they're doing and do this right now, you can select them and then right click on the workstation. Tell them to prioritize it. You can also get food by hunting. To hunt an animal, select it and click hunt or open the wildlife tab and mark it to be hunted there. Your pawns will only hunt if they are both assigned to hunting in the work tab and have a ranged weapon equipped. Make sure you have a stockpile that accepts fresh animal corpses in its storage settings so your colonists have somewhere to bring the body after they hunt it. You'll then need a butchering spot or a butchering table. This work table and any other sort of workbench will be found in the architect tab under production. The butchering spot is super fast to put down, but it reduces your yield by like 30%. So I recommend putting down a butchering table. To butcher animals at it, you need to create a bill on the butchering table, just like we did on the campfire. I'm gonna set this bill to do forever so that my colonist will always butcher any animal corpse that's available. You can also set what materials are allowed. It defaults to not allow human corpses, but desperate times may dictate that you change that. Um, I'll leave that up to you. So now we have a few meals prepared, but if we click them, we'll see that they're gonna go bad in a matter of days. We need to get some refrigeration going. To do that, we'll need a freezer. Let's use the structure tab to build a room and I'm gonna to go to the temperature tab and get an AC unit. When you're placing it, you wanna make sure that the cooling side, the blue side is facing into your room and the red exhaust side is facing out. Awesome, so we have all of that built, but if we click on our AC, we can see that it has no power. We need to get some electricity going. There are quite a few ways to generate power in RimWorld, but in the default game, you only crash land with a few ways unlocked, a wood fire generator, a chem fuel power generator, and a wind turbine. You can unlock more ways such as a water mill, solar panels, and a geothermal generator using research. We have a ton of wood at our disposal in this biome, so we're just gonna start with a wood fire generator. Now that we have our generator, we need to run a power conduit to our AC unit. The conduit just has to be close enough that our AC's little plug can reach it. Um, it's actually already reaching it, but just for the sake of this video, I'll also run a power conduit down. Once it's hooked up, we can see by clicking on the AC how much power it's using and how much excess power we have available in our power grid. You can also see the temperature is currently set to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 21 Celsius. You can adjust the temperature down to make it colder with these buttons over here. Notice that the power consumption goes up if I set it to colder. If you double wall your freezer or double door it, this will also help insulate it better. After you do have your freezer set up, you're just gonna put another stockpile zone in here. 
set it to only allow food and I would make it higher priority so that colonists will prefer to put all food here before filling up the non-refrigerated stockpiles. One thing to note is that some types of power, like a wind turbine or solar panel, will only produce electricity sometimes, like when the wind is blowing or when the sun is shining during the day. If you choose to use one of those sources, you're going to need to research batteries and you can hook up a battery to your power grid um, the same way you would hook anything else up just by running a power conduit to it and then you can use it later on when there's no electricity being produced. So one of the first things you should get down after all your absolute basics are covered is a research bench. This is the only production item you don't need to set a bill at. As long as you have a research project assigned in the research tree, your pawns assigned to researching will work on it. Keep in mind that research is naturally the very last priority for your pawns, so if you want a pawn to prioritize it, you need to turn on manual priorities and make it higher up. So now let's take a look at some of the defenses since you will get attacked sooner or later. Probably sooner rather than later. We start with sandbags and barricades, which provide some cover for your pawns to duck behind during a raid. However, a simple wall actually provides much more cover, so personally I prefer to place a few random wall columns around my perimeter. Now, there are a lot of videos on YouTube about how to build good defenses for your base. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this tutorial is not about strategy, it's about getting you comfortable with the game mechanics so you can explore the strategy aspect on your own. Some basic tips about raider behavior though, uh, raiders will take the path of least resistance to your base. It is thus advantageous for you to build your base with a choke point so that you can lure raiders to approach from one particular spot. This helps you place defenses better. There are some types of raids that won't care about this. Breach raids will just hack their way in through your walls, siege raids will bombard you with mortars from a distance, and drop raids will just land right on top of you. But I think early game especially, it helps to just kind of build a perimeter wall around your base with one or two entry points that you can keep an eye on. Another defensive structure you have right off the bat are traps. Personally, I love using traps. Um, you can make them out of a ton of different materials. Wood traps tend to just bruise your enemies, stone traps tend to maim them, um, and steel traps tend to kill them. However, something to keep in mind is that your own colonists can accidentally set off traps, so you should place them wisely. So some very basic early game defenses for me um, is just kind of like a half perimeter wall so that I can encourage raiders to enter through one particular point, as well as some sort of structure to provide cover for my pawns to hide behind and shoot, such as sandbags, barricades, or like I mentioned, I prefer to use walls. Of course, as your colony gets more technologically advanced, uh, you can actually research gun turrets and then some really powerful like autocannon turrets, uranium slug turrets, mortars, and all sorts of really high-tech defenses for your base, uh, but we don't need that at this point. I may get into some of my favorite defense strategies in another video, so if that is something you'd be interested in, let me know down in the comments. Let's look at how to control our pawns when that raid does strike. So when you get a raid, a message will pop up explaining what type of raid it is, and you can jump to location to look at them. To draft your colonists, you're going to select them and then click draft. You can then right click to place them, or right click and drag to place them in a formation. Colonists with ranged weapons will begin shooting as soon as the raider is within range. Your pawns that have melee will not go and attack a raider until they themselves are attacked unless you tell them to. So we've downed this raider immediately, but you can see that he's still alive by this little exclamation point above him and he's also still moving, so we can capture him. We're going to select a pawn and right click on the raider. Now we must have a prison cell to do this, so it's not actually letting me capture him right now. Any enclosed area with a bed or a sleeping spot marked for prisoners is a cell, so I'm going to build a really tiny, horrible cell real quick up here, and then I'm going to throw a sleeping spot in it and mark it for prisoners. Now I can select my pawn again, go back and capture him. So once we've captured him, the first order of business is to tend his injuries. My pawn assigned to doctoring is already working on tending his wounds. We can hover over them to see what the tend quality is. This will impact the likelihood of infection as well as his rate of recovery. Now here is where this tutorial starts to go sideways because while I was tending this prisoner, two of my colonists came down with malaria. <laughs> Diseases and infections are something you'll have to deal with, so I'll take this as a teaching moment. When a pawn comes down with an infection or a disease, you can hover over it in their health tab. It will show you the disease or infection percentage at the top here, and then the immunity percentage at the bottom. 
It's basically a race to 100%. If immunity gets there first, you're good. If the disease or infection gets there first, you die. Your SOL if it's a disease, but at least for infections, you can save pawns by amputating the infected body part if it seems like the immunity isn't gonna catch up in time. To do this, you would open their health tab, go to operations, and choose amputate from the options. So back to our prisoner. He's all tended up, so now we decide what to do with him. We can select him, and then in the prisoner tab, you see your options. It shows you how much resistance he has to being recruited. Your warden, or the pawn assigned to wardening, will need to wear this down to zero before he can be recruited. The happier the prisoner is, the quicker this number will go down, so making prison cells nice really works in your favor. We can also release him, and if we do that, we will get a relationship boost with his faction. So this raid was obviously a cakewalk, it was just one naked guy, um, but as your colony wealth grows, raids will get more and more difficult, so your defenses will have to evolve with them. Last but not least, I want to introduce you to the trade menu. Periodically, a trade caravan or visitors will wander onto your map tile and you will have the opportunity to trade with them. You will also be able to trade with like ships that are orbiting your planet and maybe even eventually caravan to other settlements to trade with them there. So if traders come through, you're going to choose the pawn with the best social skills and then right click on the trader that has the question mark by them. Unfortunately, I have to use a pawn with like no social skills because my two pawns with better social skills are in bed recovering from malaria. When your pawn reaches the trader, this trade menu will pop up. This is how much silver your colony has, and this whole column is our inventory. This is how much silver the trader has, and then this column is their inventory. In the middle is the transaction amount. Think of it as what is happening to our stockpile. So a negative number here means that's how much we are giving them. That's how much we're losing. A positive number means that's how much they are giving us or how much our stockpiles are gaining. So if we're selling them 10 meals, we'll see a negative 10 in this box because that's how many meals are leaving our inventory. But if we're going to buy something like say 100 bear meat, we will see a positive number in this box and then a negative number up at the top because that is how much silver we are giving them. So trading improves relations with whatever faction it is in a very minor way. Um, you can gain some extra favor by offering them gifts using this gift button down here. Now, there is one aspect of the game that I didn't get into here, and that is quests. I tend to never get that into quests, possibly because it always proves to be a death sentence for my pawns, um, and also because they aren't actually necessary until later game when you're looking to build your spaceship. If quests are something that you'd like a tutorial on, just let me know down in the comments and I'll be happy to whip one up. All right, so this has been my super basic beginner's tutorial to RimWorld. No strategy, no tips and tricks, just pure how the heck do I play this type information. If you are just getting into RimWorld and have any questions about it, let me know down in the comments. And if you found this video useful, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Good luck on the Rim!